Michael Knowles used you in the thumb. Leaders all over the triggered libs crying over Lady Ballers movie. Wait, what? I'm not. I'm not fucking triggered by it. What the hell? I like that. I like that half the time these guys are just like, if, if no one is even triggered by it, they can just like say someone trig is triggered by it. And because his audience is so, dude, dude, political polarization online has created a structure where it literally doesn't matter. The truth doesn't matter. People unironically come in here and will say stuff like, Hassan, here is exactly the opposite of what you said. And I hate you for saying this thing that you never actually said and is actually the exact opposite of what you've said. And then, like, normally at that point, you should be like, no, but you're not hearing the words that are coming out of my mouth. I'm saying the exact opposite of what you think I'm saying. And people are like, no, I'm sorry. I'm already polarized against you, so I'm not going to listen to you, and you're a bad guy. And the same goes in this structure as well. It's like, wow, liberals are so triggered. It's like, first of all, not a liberal. So you don't think that... Secondly, definitely not triggered. Why the fuck did he put me in the goddamn thumbnail of this? <laughs> hey, at least, I, at least I look handsome. You know what I mean? Did you even talk about that movie yet? I did. And I said I'm excited to watch it. I, I did. And I said I'm excited to watch it. And I thought it was like, you know, I, I think it's going to be dog shit. But... Someone at Daily, uh, Daily Wire knows your image farms clicks. Yeah. No, I know, 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 I know. We're going to do all of this. We're going to do all of this. We're going to do all of this. Uh, we'll get into all of that. Let me just blast off real quick because, like, there isn't too much going on in my life except for the fact that uh, this morning I went and um, this morning I took my mom to the, uh, to the medical facility to her doctor. And uh, for that reason, I couldn't even work out. But uh, she's all right. She's just got a steroid shot, so it's good. <laughs> um, and I took Kaya to the mall where her doctor is. I took Kaya to the mall where her doctor is, and we walked so much. And Kaya also ended up taking a fat poop inside of the mall. It's one of those, like, over... Like the, the above, it's one of those outdoor malls. So I think in her mind, she thought like, oh no, this is like a, this is like the street. And she took the funniest, fattest dumper. Every weirdo YouTube commentator uses you so hard too. Videos about you will get them like 10x their regular views. That The hate is wild. Brother, there's not really much I can do about it. I am a... Uh, a, a relatively well-known leftist content creator who has been tarnished and tarred and feathered for his uh, leftist perspectives uh, for years and years and years. And at a certain point, you just have to realize, like, no, this is not people who are mad at me even. This is more so, like, what I signify. It's just like the internet is a shitty space. There's not really much you could do about it. It's just, you know, everyone's mad. Everyone's angry all the time. Everyone's hateful all the time. And um, there's not really too much I can do about it, I guess. And it's going to keep getting worse because Twitter is like a, a massive hub for where like the direction of content changes and Twitter is basically turned into uh, Twitter is basically turned into a right wing hub. So even when people who are not like ideologically uh, invested in a particular, uh, in a particular direction, recognize that like there's enough momentum in a certain direction, they'll just make like right wing content without themselves being right wing. You know what I mean? Not saying it's okay, but you also get a lot more love than other leftist creators. It comes from the territory being the biggest and the baddest. Yeah, I mean, it's it's whatever. Uh, there's not really too much I could do about it. But yeah, Twitter is, is basically 4chan. So um, those kinds of things are always going to be there. There's really not too much to do about it. And you just kind of keep on trucking. Um, but yeah. The, the scariest part about it is that I do feel like there's a tremendous amount of right-wing ads 
and that are all over. Kurgazox made it. Internet is worse than ever. Now what? Yeah. That what is this called? The dead internet theory or something? Twitter feels like uh, it turned up. The knob show me right wing accounts like two weeks ago. It never stops. It's been like that. The knob has been slowly turning. Um, but yeah, we'll do it. We'll um. There's there's not really too much you could do about it. It's just you just got to keep on keeping on and don't get discouraged. Obviously. Obviously, at the end of the day, part of the reason why it's happening, part of the reason why it's happening is because, actually, I don't even, I don't know. It doesn't matter. What dead internet theory? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Ben Shapiro video on Palestine is such a fucking freak. What? There's a famous con. Oh, dude, I'm not going to watch this. It's going to make me fucking have an aneurysm. Kurgazog, haven't seen their content since I was flooded with people saying they're bought by the Gates Foundation, although I'm not sure how that how true that is. The internet theory is that real people are only like 5 to 10% of users on any given platform. Kind of. All right, let's do it. Intensifies in... Fall on deaf ears. Here's where bombing intensifies in Gaza as U.S. calls for restraint. Fall on deaf ears. Uh, do, 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 do. House to vote on anti-Semitism declaring anti-Zionism is anti-Semitic. Anti-Zionism equals anti-Semitism. Bill. Um, what else was I going to talk about? There's so much more. Wow, there's even a thing? Yeah, it is. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Why files the dead internet theory? This is from like a year ago too. But yeah, this is something that people have been talking about. Um. What else? What else? What else? Oh, Chelsea Manning in the building later. That's right. Building later. Ukraine funds might dry up. And play your video. Takes YouTube by storm. Get in now. It's always uh, the 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 secondary part of the plagiarism drama is, of course, like the classic. People were looking for a way out of it. Um, people were. How the fuck do you spell plagiarism? I always fuck this up. God, English is such a stupid language. Plagiarism. Plagiarism. Um, all right, all right, all right, let's do it. I got it, I got it, I put it, I put it in. Okay, so, did you hear that Loewig is coming back to Twitch? Yes, of course. But it's not like a full-blown Twitch thing. He's just going to be able to stream on Twitch as well, I'm, I am I think. Or, I mean, let's see what he said. I don't know, I, I don't want to leak anything that the fucking... Here, let, let's see, let's see what he had to say. Thanks. Thank you. Uh... I've gathered you all here today to talk about who's going to win amongst all the platforms. Twitch, Kick, YouTube, even Facebook. Uh, are there any questions? No rumble? No, no rumble. Uh, next. Yeah, why would they ask him if he's going to rumble? Oh, that's right, because he's a right-wing YouTuber. MAGA male. MAGA male much? Yeah, exactly. Everybody knows, man. Everybody knows you can't fucking hide the truth. You can't hide from the truth, and you can't hide the truth. No, no so comment. So help you God. You in the back. Uh, last week, fell down the second half of the field goal percentage. Just 25 points below your average. Do you care to commentate on what's going on? What? I think you're in the wrong. Uh, let's just cut uh, to the shit. Oh shit. I'm going to be representing Team YouTube at the first ever Creator Dodgeball Championship. What? The, I, the Creator Dodgeball Championship. <coughs> Clap. Thank you. 
this was his big announcement. Right? Okay. You throw it to me now. You throw it to me now. Fuck. Okay. Uh, if I caught that though, if I caught that, my teammate would have been back in. Can we run it back? Can we run it back? You yourself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm a part of this. Does this mean you leaked him staying with YouTube and also streaming on Twitch? I thought this was the video where he talks about that. But it turns out he just debated it for the dodgeball thing. But I think he made another YouTube video talking about how he I'm going back to Twitch is the debate. Back to streaming on Twitch. It's been a couple of years since I dropped this video where I blew up a damn car, which was how I announced that I was leaving Twitch to start streaming on YouTube, which was a big deal for, for me and, and I guess nerds who care about live streaming because I, I had done some cool things on Twitch. I was the most subscribed to live streamer at one point and I had left for a relatively unproven platform, YouTube. And I explained why in one of my first mogul mails ever, a video that kind of started this whole channel uh, and it basically got clipped into a bunch of dramatic YouTube shorts. I had flipped a coin and heads was Twitch, tails was- A uh, whole lot of MAGA male mustache hate in here. I like the mustache. YouTube and it had gone with heads. I and the skinny of it is that I felt more appreciated by YouTube than I did by Twitch. They made me feel like a person. They made me feel seen. It felt like our goals were aligned. In didn't make me run three minute ad breaks at the top of the hour, for example, which comes at the top of every hour. But of course, you can avoid those ads as long as you subscribe for five dollars or for free. You know, these are differences, obviously. But uh, who's to say? Here's the three minute ad break now. Fucking let's go. Twitch, it felt like I was another cog in the machine. Uh, and it didn't hurt that YouTube was also offering me more money. <laughs> but now the two years is up and I'm going back to Twitch. Part time. All right, let me explain. Let me explain. Okay, when I went back to YouTube to do the re-signing, I realized that my goals are not to make the most money possible. My goals are not to get the highest average viewership possible. My goal, simply put, is to do really cool events that I think are cool and, and also dope and also have them be seen by the most amount of people. The biggest cultural event possible. If I want to pour my heart in, in, into something, I want it to, to be seen by others. I don't even care if it makes money. Don't tell the people that offer in that, but it's true. And I'm capping myself if I'm only streaming these events on YouTube or if I'm only streaming them on Twitch. It'd be a lot better if I streamed them on both. And so that was my proposal to YouTube. Now for daily streams, if I want to play Suica game or Lethal Company or Top Frag and Valorant like I usually do, that oh. will still happen on- Bro, this is classic right-wing nonsense, dude. I can't believe he's fucking lying. It's like, this, is, this video should be taken down for fake news. Like Top Frag on Valorant? What the fuck are we doing here? What the absolute fuck are we doing on YouTube? Here? But I am trying to do way more events. How often will these happen? Well, the goal is every couple of months. There's specifics in the contract on what an event is and what I am allowed to co-stream on both Twitch and YouTube. But, but the skinny is at, at least every two months, I'm hoping to uh, do an event that'll be co-streamed on both. Everyone remembers the last 2v2v2v2 Tuesday that I participated and I had to carry his bitch ass in Valorant. I'm just saying, uh, this is something that this is something that people need to remember. This is something that people need to remind themselves of quite regularly because um, the the censors at the MAGA male right wing factory try to take this reality down. They try to fucking make people think differently, except it's the truth. I did. I carried. He threw. It's not a problem. This is the truth, and uh, yeah, anyway, Both. let's move on. All right, I'm not even totally uh, signed up for the idea that co-streaming daily streams is good, at least for me in the position I'm in, so I'm not really interested in doing that yet. So YouTube, still here. YouTube guy doing regular YouTube December live streams. 10th, Events this year, will be on both, no, and you might have noticed that it won't be on twitch.tv slash Ludwig, right? That was another stipulation of the contract. It had to be a channel name that didn't make people think I was a full-time Twitch streamer, I didn't tell them I would clickbait this video, but that's why the channel name will be Mogul Moves. And you might be wondering, when is my first Twitch slash YouTube stream? And it's this week. It's actually this Sunday, December 10th, around noon. I'm going to be streaming the Creator Dodgeball World Championship, which I'm really fucking excited about. It features six teams. Each team's a different platform, and we're going to find the best platform at least the best platform at dodgeball. So it'll be team kick with a bunch of kick streamers, team Twitch, team YouTube, team Facebook, team 
podcasts, and finally, the six half of the kick streamers are fucking banned, though. How the fuck? <laughs> How did he find a bunch of kick streamers that were down to play dodgeball that are are simply are simply a part of uh, that that are not banned on Twitch at least? Six team is Team Chess Boxing, because this also coincides with a chess boxing merch drop. Now, it's not happening this year. I, 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 we already gone through that. I already made a video about that. But we still have a bunch of really cool merch that I'm very proud of uh, that, that I need to sell so, so we don't um, fire Aiden. Anyway, uh, this is what it looks like. I think it's some of our best stuff. This is a reversible jacket. Wow, cool. Shill moment, Ludwig. Very cool. Ludwig.gg, if you want to get it. It's available right now. You can get it by Christmas. Anyway, that'll be the first day I stream. Now, you might be wondering, has YouTube worked? All right. After this year, are you going to stay with YouTube again? Are you always going to be the YouTube guy? Will you ever go back to Twitch full time? And I looked at the data a little bit because YouTube okay. has finally added live stream data. And I have some answers for you. Now, first off, this is my concurrent viewership and my peak viewership over the two years that I've been on YouTube. And you can see my average viewership is just under 17,000. My peak viewership, however, hit 300,000. Uh, I think it was technically like three. 20 something but but they a few numbers got lost in the tabulations but but still okay here's how it works youtube has a much broader base okay youtube is a much larger platform so technically on youtube you have a way higher ceiling you can have these massive events you can have these massive numbers of views you can have a a major following it's also entirely dependent on whether or not youtube is interested in giving you that reach youtube on the other hand has terrible discovery, and has no interest in actually pumping live streaming numbers. It is literally a matter of turning the dial for them. If they tweaked it even remotely, even like marginally, every single YouTube streamer could technically get hundreds of thousands of live viewers, real live viewers, as a matter of fact. However, for YouTube, live viewership is costly, and they do not believe that it's an important market for them to tackle and that's, uh, they've made that clear. They've made that obvious. They, uh, they tried it under the watchful eye of Fwiz, who left when he, was a, when he was in charge of YouTube gaming. This was like a big, uh, big thing that they did. But Susan Wojcicki left, Fwiz left. And of course, I think that in the new YouTube era that we're in, they care way more about VOD. And more importantly, they care about shorts. They do not see Twitch as a comp uh, competition that they care about, a market share that they want to tackle. Live streaming is not a market share they want to tackle. They want shorts. They want to tackle TikTok. And they've seen a tremendous number. They've seen a massive increase in, in uh, traffic and uh, a massive increase in, I guess, like watch time, people staying on the platform when they moved over to shorts. And they experiment, they're continuously experimenting with like shorter and shorter forms of content. That is precisely the reason why uh, the live streaming is in the exact opposite direction and they don't really give a shit about it. So, this is why Twitch is uh, allowed to be way more open about dual streaming, co streaming, and they don't really give a fuck. They're like, we are the king of live streaming. If you come here, if you come here, you can do your live stream here. You can do your live stream there. You can do it anywhere you want. doesn't really matter. No more exclusive contracts. Yada, yada, yada. So, that's the situation with uh, Ludwig. That's the situation with YouTube in general. However, this average number, this average view count is probably higher for Ludwig. In the time frame where he was on YouTube for his entire duration and for his entire contract, his average live stream viewership numbers actually probably went up like a little bit. I suspect, overall, and uh, that is because YouTube did, and still does, have the capacity to open the view count faucet, and YouTube does have a much larger audience base, so YouTube numbers are supposed to be way more inflated than Twitch numbers, but because they don't do that, it doesn't really matter. That is the highest peak viewership I've ever had in my streaming career, ever, and I think this next year we can crush it, multi-streaming on both, and adding them together. The average viewership is a little worse. I'll come clean. My last month on Twitch, I averaged 18,500. I think my last year I, on Twitch, I averaged over 20,000. So, so we're doing in the thousands worse. But I don't really care about that. 
because it's not my goal. My goal isn't to be a average high viewership live stream. I realize that my shelf life is coming up. There'll only be such a, a small period of time where I'm able to relate to people who care about watching live streams in the first place. And then someone younger and funnier and who's able to relate more will come along and beat me out. So I'm not going to play this game and, and cling on to life. I just want to do dope shit while I can do dope shit while people care about the dope shit that I do. A uh, couple things, though, have gone better. All right. The peak viewership was one of them. But another thing that has done a lot better since moving over to YouTube is the views for videos. Uh, the video yeah. view. App I think for him, he always was um, a live streamer that cared a lot about beefing up his YouTube a live streamer that would make YouTube videos on his live stream. And then he did a great job with that. It always, it worked. It worked. Uh, it paid in dividends, not only with a fat YouTube contract, but, it, but also with like him becoming a, a, a solid YouTuber in general. So he moved in that direction a long time ago, or maybe even from the jump. And he did a really good job with it. And I think that um, that is also another reason why he kept, kept uh, pumping up his weekly subscribership numbers, his weekly video gained, uh, weekly video views gained, obviously, because like YouTube, he just like when he full blown invested into YouTube, then of course, his YouTube exploded even further. Average skyrocketed. I think it, I was averaging around half a mil per video before, and now it, it, it is right around a million views per video. Uh, and you can see the weekly video views gained here. Don't, don't, you know, take it with a grain of salt. This also includes YouTube shorts. Um, but, yeah. but I, you know, I, I tried to do it all. I tried to do it all. Uh, my goal when I went to YouTube was to try as hard as I could to be a multifaceted creator who could do live streams, who could do YouTube shorts and who could do regular videos and, and, and be the best YouTuber possible. And I'm going to give YouTube another year, but I will also add a caveat here. I'm a little bit concerned about YouTube. All right. YouTube guy here, I have to admit, there are some problems. And those problems in the two years that I've been here haven't been addressed at the speed that I or other live streamers would like. I made this list a while back, but it includes just a few of the problems that exist for live streaming on YouTube that don't necessarily exist on Twitch. One of the glaring ones, you can't even stream longer than 12 hours. If you do, the VOD disappears into the ether. I can't even watch my VODs longer than 12 hours. I have to end the stream, otherwise it is gone. That is a problem. You can't edit VODs that are over six hours. So if you listen to one copywritten thing and the whole VOD gets smoked, you're screwed. That, you can't do anything about it. These, these, again, are huge, huge issues. And when I first went over to YouTube a couple of years ago, I made the company Truffle with the goal of combating these things, of making not just YouTube live streaming, but all live streaming a better experience. And it has worked. Truffle has been great. But I see a clear split, a clear divide. Except everything that's on Truffle should have been embedded onto the platform. And if YouTube actually cared about making their live streaming part, uh, making their live streaming user interface a, a better journey, caring about live streaming in general, they would have done that, which they didn't do. Um, he, he commissioned it. He, he got someone on his team to make uh, one of his like moderators. I think he's like a coder as well to make basically like FFZ and BTTV, but for, YouTube, but it didn't, it was auto, right? Yeah. Automated made it. Um, however, like I said, ultimately, if YouTube cared, they would integrate this stuff into the platform either by purchasing it. It's a full on company. We got investor funding. Nice. Um, they would have, uh, but it, like I said, if YouTube cared about it, they would have probably purchased it and then worked very hard to integrate it onto their platform, but I don't think they give a shit about live streaming. They give a shit about shorts. They give a shit about defeating TikTok. Divide. And I'm What's hoping up, this next year. Oh guys, it's mogul moves. I'm with dummy VV. What does that mean? I don't even know what you're that saying. What I fear will happen doesn't happen because I want to keep streaming on YouTube until I eventually retire. But my concern is that YouTube doesn't care about live streaming. They care about something else that you'll probably see on the home screen if you open up YouTube right now. YouTube Shorts. Now, you get a, the occasional recommended live stream or maybe it's in your subscriptions box, but for the most part, you'll get videos, and if you're on your mobile especially, you'll get a shit ton of shorts. Yep. And I think the reason is because YouTube is threatened by TikTok. Like, the existence of YouTube 
is threatened by TikTok. If you look yep. at this, the amount of, of uh, users on TikTok versus YouTube in the US, this was last year, uh, TikTok is gaining rapidly, specifically with younger audiences. And those will be the older audience. Dude, you will never get recommended live streaming. Um, it, but it's not even that. If they like tried to fix the directory of the live streams, for example, like, or if they made it so that it was easier to access your favorite content creators when they're live, you quite literally could improve the live streaming numbers tenfold. And YouTube, unironically, as a consequence of that, because of the massive number of real viewers that would be watching your live stream, would actually get a tremendous amount of organic shifts from content creators, either dual streaming, multicasting, or straight up casting to YouTube alone. It's just, they don't care because it's not profitable. They don't care because they don't give a shit. That's it. Like, even if YouTube did not create the same level of monetization opportunities, if they just like massage the platform a little bit, turn down the view count dial a little bit, just like Facebook did way back in the day when they moved into the video initiatives, when they like did a couple things where they made it seem like everyone was getting millions and millions of views. Um, YouTube could, because it has real eyeballs, shift the attention away a little bit towards the live streaming side, but they don't care. They don't, they don't want to do that because as Ludwig is correctly pointing out, they care way more about the, the diminishing market share on the younger audiences that they're losing out potentially to TikTok. It's when time passes, as it always does. And so this has a real chance of killing YouTube as a whole, you know, and that, that's something they're concerned about. What isn't a concern of theirs is the title Twitch has killed YouTube, because that'll never happen. I don't think Twitch is entering the VOD space. I don't think they're trying to compete there. I think they're just chilling in the live stream space, offering their own unique slice of, of uh, content creation online. Yeah. And so they have almost this like handshake agreement where Twitch is the uh, the massive um, shareholder. They they have the, the majority uh, viewership for all live streaming. And YouTube has been floating around, just doing their thing. They haven't gone up too much. They haven't gone down too much. Uh, Facebook's on the down and down, kicks nowhere to be seen. And there's no real need to rush into, into being a better product. Twitch on Money Papers isn't financially positive according to AWS. Yes, except... Twitch could be the most profitable platform on the planet. It's just a matter of accounting. I've said this before. Because AWS is the most costly part of live streaming, it's simply accounting that makes Twitch not profitable or profitable. I know that you can turn around and say, well, they have to adjust it off of market rates, okay? And maybe on market rates, live streaming, uh, live streaming is not profitable live web hosting is not profitable certainly that part is probably true okay however amazon owns aws and they own twitch so it doesn't really matter they don't need they don't they don't need it to be a uh, uh, market rate it doesn't have to be and it's not by the way it literally isn't it's just that they say it is and they uh, get the CEO to make decisions as though it's not profitable because the higher ups say it's not profitable. ...than Twitch or to beating Twitch because Twitch will never kill YouTube, TikTok will. So let's combat that, at least what I think based off. If that works out, we can check out the live streaming spot maybe. That's how it feels. That's at least what I think based off some conversation with people who are at YouTube. And because of that, I'm worried that in the time that I have as a live streamer, where I have things that people want to hear, I want to talk about, they won't be the platform that people should be on. I'm still the YouTube guy. I'm still waving my red YouTube banner, but these are my concerns. Those are my hopes. And that's why I'm uh, now part streaming on Twitch for, for events specifically, which will happen every couple of months. All right, anyway, that's all. Thank you for watching. I appreciate it. Uh, not just this video, but the past couple of years and any live streams if you have. December 10th, I will see you on Twitch and YouTube uh, and Ludwig.gg if you want to get the merch. All right, see you later. Goodbye. See you later. Goodbye. Say goodbye to Coots too because she says goodbye as well. I joined your fucking uh, event server. I don't know if you're still in here, Lud. <coughs> but yeah, that's the situation on hand. That's what's going on. Ironic because TikTok is moving in the opposite direction where they are trying to improve watch time and trying to pump out one minute longer, uh, longer than one minute videos on TikTok. 
Um, what's the new channel? It's the same channel. He just changed the name to Mogul Moves. That's it. I saw a friend of mine to become a MAGA communist. What the hell do I do? Just laugh, I guess. I don't know what to say to that. Um, TikTok is pumping its uh, videos that are longer than a minute long. Uh, it's also pumping the shop, which is huge. I mean, they're moving in the Weibo direction pretty aggressively. Uh, or Doyen, right? Isn't it Doyen? Uh, I think. Whatever. They're, they're, it's smart. It's super smart. I've talked to I've talked to Dan Clancy about this before about like uh you know QVC and and uh whether or not there could be like an integration like a QVC integration within Amazon and and whether or not that would be a direction to move towards no not Tom Clancy Dan Clancy the CEO and uh, there's already an Amazon shop, Amazon video platform, like an Amazon live streaming platform on Amazon. It's uh, where content goes to die. I don't know if you guys have ever watched it. I've watched it before uh, for fun just to get a better understanding. And um, it, doesn't seem like, uh, it doesn't seem like there is a space for that yet, but we'll see. Yeah, people live stream on Amazon. I don't know if you guys knew that or not. There is a basically QVC live streaming happening on Amazon all the time. Yeah. They'll get like random Shopify ass influencers to do live streams where uh, they are just like shilling product that you can go and purchase on Amazon directly. And it's already on Amazon and no one knows about it. Hard to find personally. I don't know who the fuck is watching it, really. But if China is ahead of the game on this kind of thing, if China is ahead of the game on this kind of thing, and I do think they are, then uh, the, the future of live streaming is within QVC. The biggest live streamers on the planet are not in the Western world. It's not Ninja. It's not eBay. It's not any of those people. It's not myself, definitely. It's actually a Chinese guy by the name of uh, Lipstick King. He sells lipstick live. And he gets literally, on average, almost a million fucking viewers, uh, concurrent viewers. Uh, maybe not a million, but his return stream got a million. Uh, it's just, they're crazy. They're crazy with it. They're nutty with it. What the fuck is this? Let's be clear. Hamas is your problem too. Paid by Jewbelong.org. Feel like Baltimore is way more problems to deal with than Hamas. What the fuck is Hamas going to do in Downey, California? Yeah. Yeah, dude, there's tunnels underneath. Um, isn't this just kind of awful feeling that it seems like every fun thing on the internet isn't profitable, so it's just become worse and worse over the years? Yeah. But we'll see. We'll see what happens. Um... I think Amazon understands that the future of content Amazon understands that the future of content still is in the live streaming space. There's always going to be in my opinion a place for live streaming online. Uh especially with the cord cutter generation getting a lot of their information online uh and and certainly not getting it on television. There's a need for even people like myself. So uh, while the Twitch platform has lost viewers, hemorrhage viewers in the North American market, it's growing tremendously in, in Latin America and in the Spanish-speaking market and many other places. Uh, however, however, uh, overall, there's still always going to be a place where people want to tune into immediately when, like, shit's popping off in real time. What is this? You this want shit to ain't nothing to me, Dracula man. flow? What the fuck is this? What, why, why? Why do you keep linking this to me? I don't understand it. Why Why yeah. do you want me to watch Haters it? Haters and shambles. They stay picking the corn out of my shit. The Smith... Like, I'm not watching this, dude. I, I don't know what the fuck this is. I don't know why you want me to... What is happening? I, I don't know. I don't know what this is. Is this some fucking... Is this like the new Skibbity Toilet? Is that what it is? TikTok is also on its QVC arc. It's, it's pushing shopping live streams a lot. TikTok has always pushed the shopping live streams. Great interview on Ali on Apex Influence. Oh, yeah. Ali, well, she did a fucking massive uh, 
APAC influence video. We're, we'll take a look at it as well. It's so good. Stop being such a whiny bitch. It's Monday. We're going to do news, okay? I don't know what the fuck Dracula Flow is. Thank you, Thamacius, for the playlist. Anyway, do you have plans like Lud to, for postage stuff in your career? Are you going to be live and alive till you drop? I don't know. Um, uh, this is the first time in my career where I haven't, like, over the course of a half of a year almost, I have experienced a downward shift in uh, view count overall and the community getting smaller. This is literally the first time ever. Up until this very moment, I had probably never in my entire career experienced a downward shift for this long of a period of time. You call this a career? Well, I mean, when at a certain point, and, uh, you know, this is meant with no disrespect. Uh, my dad also was like, what are you going to do? When are you going to get a career? When are you going to get a career? And it's like, well, at a certain point, if you're making a lot of money off of it, it's, it's a career. It might be a new one. But um, the thing is, the thing is, there were throughout the past, throughout the past couple of years, there time and time again, Time and time again, my haters have said, oh, just wait till Bernie drops out, and then you're done. Oh, wait till the election cycle is over, and then you're done. And it actually never happened. Obviously, there were spikes uh, in that process where I hit like 200,000 live concurrent viewers or even 100,000 live concurrent viewers over and, and stayed over there for an extended period of time, maybe like a week at, on end, okay? However... Always, it would normalize back to, uh, let's say, if uh, the average concurrent viewership number for me in the year 2019 was like 5K, and then 2020, the average concurrent viewership number in that election cycle, the peak viewership went up to like hundreds of thousands, but the concurrent viewership number went up to 20,000, um, and, then, and then everybody thought, oh, it's going to go away, 2021, 2022, 2023, it usually just kept rising steadily the concurrent the average concurrent viewership basically hitting 30k okay this is the first time over the course of many many years this is the core uh this is the first time over the course of uh, uh since 2019 where i've experienced a downward shift in basically uh, uh over the course of a six uh, over the course of a of a six month period, I'm still in the top for subscribers. I'm still one of the top content creators on the platform, but it doesn't matter. It's like I'm looking at my own, I'm looking at my own numbers, and uh, I'm looking at uh, the numbers of the platform in general. And yes, it is it has gone down. This is true. So this is also one of the first instances where this is also one of the first instances where I've thought about potentially. Uh, you know, diversifying my content a little bit. You think if you were pro-Israel, your numbers would be better? Probably. Uh, I actually, I don't even know. I think if I just didn't cover Israel at all and continued doing, like, diverse coverage. This is a short-lived dip with the election around another corner. I think that's just copium. I saw your peak concurrent viewership was uh, two years ago around this time when we were doing MasterChef. It was around 45K, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. Anyway, regardless, regardless. Do you think it has to do with the we're in the peak brunch politics a couple of weeks ago? Pause society is fully in person now. Jobs are even making uh come back to the office and travel was peaking, plus the site having tons of people abounding it from other forms of content. Maybe. There's a there's a multitude of different reasons, okay? Nothing happens because of one singular reason. Um overall Overall, the peak is gone by, but it's still a tremendous number of viewers. Uh, viewers. Like, it's crazy. The, I, Considering that I never thought that I would even get to this position ever, let alone be one of the top content creators on the platform or literally the top content creator on the platform, I, I will never take it for granted. Like, this is something that I think is insane overall. Um... So it's still great. It, it's still great in general, but I do sometimes think about, uh, I do sometimes think about like diversifying my content, maybe doing some sit down stuff that is uh, what people are tired of politics in their lives. Woken up. Yeah. Are you going to go back to reality show reacts? I feel like that always boosts viewership. 
no, there is um there is a a, a real negative uh, opinion on 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 a person like myself doing React Randall stuff. A smaller content creator could watch everything that they want to watch. A smaller content creator, or even a larger content creator that many people like, like XQC, can watch entire episodes of SpongeBob on here and get away with it for years and years and years. But uh, if I did it, I would get fucking destroyed. We're gonna begin. So that definitely has uh, limited what I can and can't watch. However, it doesn't really matter. More collabs, some I need to do. Instead of just like sitting in my own cave and constantly festering uh, in anger and resentment due to the awful, emotionally tumultuous uh, content that I'm, uh, I'm watching and, and covering and talking about. Uh, I, I just need to go back to the basics and uh, offer more diversity, which I will eventually. I'm just too stubborn to do so. <sighs> All right. Some interesting news from what the New York Times. A rocket most likely fired by Hamas struck an Israeli military base believed to be the housed of many of the nuclear capable missiles. A visual analysis by the New York Times found that's insane. Don't be chasing viewership. That is not the point. My friend, I'm a political commentator with a genuine ideological perspective. Uh, my entire goal is to reach a audience that is broad and charitable so they understand my position. So even from the obvious, like, this is my job standpoint, you're wrong. But also beyond this job, J Omega Lol B, I also personally am invested in what uh, I cover. I want as many people as possible to hear the things that I have to say and hear it in a charitable fashion. That is the whole point of why I do what I do. It won't change my messaging as it hasn't when I had 30 people watching me and it won't when I had 300 people watching me and it didn't when I had a thousand people watching me or 30,000 people watching me. That is not going to change, but of course it's better uh, if there are more people listening to what I have to say in a charitable way, for the record, of course. Charitability is still key. It's very important. But yes, reach is definitely important. <clears throat> um, all right. I think a smaller community is better, to be honest. Yeah, because you're watching it from your own perspective. Yes, it is a, it is a selfish hipster perspective to be like, yeah, I don't want that many people to watch because then you know, my voice could be heard, you know, in the chat and it's cozier. And I understand that, but, uh, it's, it's of course significantly better when this is not gate kept and as many people as possible reach this content. The whole point is you want people to hear what I have to say and also listen to it in a charitable capacity so that their perspective will change so that you have more allies you have more allies and you have uh, more people that are engaging in community organizing, more people engaging in unionizing their workplaces. And that's a good thing. Anyway. Um, people claim they want a smaller viewer size yet disappear during gaming when the vibes are immaculate. Yeah, exactly. Huh. <sighs> All right. What kind of drugs does Twitch let you consume on stream? Nicotine, caffeine. I guess if you're secretive enough, you could do all the drugs. Anyway. Um, yeah, we're going to talk about the house resolution in a moment. All right. Uh, the Houthis are back. They're back at it again. What would you tell yourself from five years ago? Don't interact with the haters ever and uh, focus on your own shit. And don't admit that you're a socialist. Those are, the, those are the three things. Don't get so mad, which I've been telling myself for five years and I have a hard-ass time. And don't interact, with your, uh, don't interact with your haters ever. There's no reason they're never charitable. And I, it's, a, it's a lesson I will never understand. All right. Houthis are at it again. In, though, with the news, major escalations in the Israeli-Hamas war... And some of it involves the American military. Just over the weekend, 
An American destroyer, the USS Kearney, intervened when multiple commercial ships were attacked by missiles and drones in the Red Sea. Iran-backed Houthi rebels from Yemen claimed responsibility for at least two of these attacks. Meanwhile, Israel says it's expanding its ground war inside Gaza against Hamas. The military is now urging residents and Palestinians who have... I don't want to be weird, but after looking at your numbers on your Twitch channel, I realized the biggest loss was on followers, so probably it's a lot of people leaving the website and not just your content. No, people don't just, like, unfollow, brother. Wait, how do you look at that? I don't even know how to look at that. Is this Sully Gnome? I've never actually looked at my followers on Twitch at all. Followers gained? What does that mean? Like, I've lost a lot of followers? Oh, those are probably bots. That's like, oh, those are viewers. No, wait, hold on. Like when you're when when the follower count changes on Twitch, it's probably like bot purges or whatever. That's what that is. Who the fuck looks at the show and the streamers themselves? Jesus Christ, how powerful social are you, Chatter? Literally, this is the platform to be like that. This is the entire selling point of this platform in general is literally this everyone personally everyone personally is invested haters and lovers alike are personally invested in that sort of thing and they they basically feel like a sense of purpose off of being like oh i did this like i made this person me and all my friends made this person like less liked online evacuated northern Gaza to also evacuate parts of southern Gaza as well. Question is, where do they go? We'll have more on the Israeli offensive shortly from Chris Livesay, who's monitoring it from Jerusalem. But begin now with Ed O'Keefe, who's been following the attacks in the Red Sea. Ed, good morning. The USS Kearney has been a little too busy for comfort. What do we know? That's right, Tony. Good morning. Happy Monday. This is the latest series of attacks by the Iranian-backed Houthis in the region since the start of the Israel-Hamas war and signals yet again how U.S. and international ships continue to be targeted or forced to respond to the attacks. According to U.S. Central Command, over the span of more than four hours, the USS Kearney responded to distress calls from three commercial vessels owned and operated by multiple countries that were struck by missiles launched from the Houthi-controlled areas within Yemen. The Kearney is a Navy destroyer sent to the region for protection and as a deterrent. It shot down three drones heading in its direction, but the Pentagon says it cannot assess at this time whether the Kearney was a target. The Houthi... I mean, they've said this... Did this happen already uh, once again, where they said that um, the Houthis were actually directing their missiles and also their drones in, in, uh, in the direction of an a, of a American carrier? And then they said, oops, my bad. They actually weren't trying to do that. So it could be one of those, you know, this is not the first time this has happened. These claimed credit for the attacks. As the Pentagon says, the group represents, quote, a direct threat to international commerce and maritime security, adding that while these attacks were launched by the Houthis, the group is fully enabled by Iran and that the U.S. will consider all appropriate responses. Now, also on Sunday, a U.S. defense official says the U.S. carried out a drone strike in Iraq after seeing that preparations were underway for an attack on U.S. service members there. Since mid-October, there have been at least 74 attacks on U.S. forces named in Iraq and Syria. Ed, thank you. Israel military says its ground forces are operating against Hamas on all parts of the Gaza Strip. The bombing campaign is intensified in the southern Gaza areas as well. Um, we're back. We've dialed it back up. It's full scale once again. Full scale ethnic cleansing is happening, um, all around uh, Gaza. The says its war on Gaza has entered a new phase, and that Hamas positions all across the Strip will be targeted. We're pursuing Hamas wherever Hamas is hiding. Regarding the Houthi attack yesterday, the most interesting bit is the last paragraph, suggesting there may be a response by U.S. forces. At approximately 3.30 uh, p.m., the MV number 9 was struck by a missile fire from Houthi-controlled areas in Yemen while operating international shipping lanes in the Red Sea. The Panamanian flag, Bermuda, and UK-owned and operated bulk carrier reported damage and no casualties. At approximately 4.30 p.m., the MV Sophie 
two sent a distress call stating that they were struck by a missile. Carney again responded to the distress call and reported no significant damage. While en route to render support, Carney shot down a UAV headed in its direction. Sophie, too, is a Panamanian flag bulk carrier crewed by sailors from eight countries. These attacks represent a direct threat to international commerce and maritime security, which is what the Houthis were doing. They have been making it as difficult as possible to, to send ships over the Red Sea by uh, throwing pot shots and maybe even sometimes taking over, carry, uh, taking over ships, as they have done, with the express purpose of uh, crippling the uh, Israeli economy, or at least, at the very least, moving the attention that the U.S. forces have, the U.S. Navy has in the area, or coalition navies have in the area, towards them. So, because every moment that they spend monitoring and actively interfering with uh, Houthi rocket fire is a moment that they're not spending uh, on, on anything else. So, they have jeopardized the lives of international crews representing multiple countries around the world. We have also every reason to believe that these attacks, while launched by the Houthis in Yemen, are fully enabled by Iran. And the United States will consider all appropriate responses in full coordination with its international allies and partners. So, for the record... Um, for those of you who don't know, the, the ships and the flags or the international crew doesn't matter. It's rarely ever do you have like a Israeli ship with an Israeli flag, if at all, as a matter of fact. They all have uh, these, different, uh, these different flags and different banners on them. And they're almost always uh, international uh, crews that are from many different backgrounds. It's mostly the, the, the flag usually is a like tax haven thing. It's more so about, uh, it's more so about what they're carrying and where they're carrying it and who they're carrying it for. So that that in and of itself is like you know is is unimportant. You'll have an international crew with a Panamanian flag, uh, sending like Elbit Systems uh, uh, rockets to Israel. You know what I mean? Like that are carrying rockets or munitions into Israel, and. I don't know uh, how valid the intel that the Houthis have are, um, but I assume that they're now just trying to make it as difficult as possible for all ships to pass through um, or, or all commerce to operate without any kind of, uh, without any kind of influence or involvement uh, in the Red Sea. If you look at a map of the Red Sea... And all of the uh, and all of the countries surrounding the Red Sea, you get a better understanding of why the United States feels the way they do about ensuring or, or about stabilizing the region and utilizing foreign partners like Saudi Arabia or even playing a role in. Where the fuck is it? Let me just find a map. God damn it. Where is the map? Not to get too much like real life lore here, but. On. Oh, this is good, I think. Go. Booty, Ethiopia, Eritrea, Sudan, Egypt. So the irony is that uh, we watched that video about Djibouti on the come up, but like low key, high key, kind of on the come up. How many arrows are on it? You be the uh, deciding factor here, and Somalia as well at the at the tip of that the horn. Um. So this is this is an important uh, this is a important pathway for commerce. And if Yemen is consistently making it as difficult as possible to you know, manage ships through there, obviously that is going to require a lot of American interference and American protection. It's a massive trade route. So, yeah. All right. Going back to... Going back to the Israeli military operation, Israeli military says ground forces are operating against Hamas in all of the Gaza Strip. In the north and in the south, every rocket launcher Weapons Depot, Command and Control Center, Senior Commander, Underground Infrastructure, and any hideout where our hostages may be held. 
Our war is against Hamas, not against the people of Gaza. Uh, to Tel Aviv now, our correspondent yeah, okay. Rankan is standing by for us there. So yeah, uh, we know that that's not the case. We know that that has never really been the case. Um, I think they've basically proven that time and time again. So much so that uh, I think that, you know, they're embarrassing America, showing to the rest of the world that they don't even have, uh, they're not even listening to the United States of America all too much. Because the reality of it is that Israel's uh, bloodthirsty, vendetta-fueled, uh, accelerated Nakba campaign in the Gaza Strip has clearly, clearly uh, created a destabilized environment in the region and is making it harder for the regional partners like the Gulf states, like the North African uh, states that are uh, willing and able to, because their leadership is willing and able to, uh, openly align with Israel and engage in normalization agreements, uh, they are putting those countries and their leadership at odds with the population. All those countries want weapons. All those countries want uh, American weapons. All those countries want America to give them uh, whatever the fuck they want and also to let them dominate their nation states in uh, any way, shape, or form they want to. One great example I can give you is Turkey, which is not in that area, but in the Middle East. Uh, on the other side of the Mediterranean Sea, Erdogan says a whole bunch of shit about Israel regularly. And dummies on Twitter go, oh my God, he's so fucking based. He's so red-pilled. He is Reis. He is going to defeat Israel. The reality is Erdogan is not doing any of those things. 30 plus percent of the metal that goes into the steel that goes into Israel goes directly through Turkey. 40% of the oil goes from Azerbaijan into Turkey through pipelines and then directly into Israel. If Turkey wanted to, they could literally cut 40% of Israel's fuel, but they will never do that because it's not about actually uh, launching or mounting a serious opposition to Israel's genocidal campaign in the Gaza Strip. It's simply about saying the right things while playing the role that you're supposed to be playing. That's precisely what that's precisely what Erdogan has been doing. That's precisely what every Gulf leader has been doing as well. They keep going, oh, I hate what you're doing, Israel. Please stop. While simultaneously, they're like, yeah, do whatever the fuck you want, King. We love it. Okay? So just remember that. It's all political theater. It's all political posturing. You are not supposed to... Abi, bu yakıt gönderme meselesiyle başka makaleler var mı? Evet, var. Uh, what was it? The Washington Institute? Oh, here. This is, I mean, the TurkishMinute.com actually sources it directly from the Washington Institute. The Baku Tbilisi Jaylan, uh, Jayhan pipeline supplies around 40% of Israel's annual consumption. Here it is. It's from the Washington Institute of Near East Policy. Azerbaijan's cooperation with Israel goes beyond Iran tensions. This is back in fucking 2013, for the record. But there you go. Here's the source for those of you who are interested in finding out more. Um, so, yeah, ultimately, uh, Israel is an extension of American foreign policy in the region, and all so of these other countries that say that they're actually very critical of Israel will still turn around and do everything they have been doing. Ulan FETÖ'cü diyorlar. Abi yakıt gönderme. Ne FETÖ'cü diyorlar. Ulan Washington Institute işte ne FETÖ'cü. Evet. FETÖ'cü medyacı günün sonunda Fethullah Gülen CIA. Ama Washington Institute'da Amerikan e, e, propaganda makinesinin bir parçası. Turkish people say uh, this is a Fethullah Gülen operation. But the reality is Turkey's involvement with Israel is always going to be Western backed. Just like Fethullah Gülen is a CIA Western uh, uh, asset. A Western-backed CIA asset. Turkish Minute için. A Turkish Minute is straight. Washington Institute'a bak yani. Asıl önemli olan o. Anyway. It has now been confirmed that the IDF is now more worried about the quantity versus quality of their strikes. Yeah.
so the thing is Um, what is this? Exclusive. Head of Israel Shimbet states, in a recording obtained by Channel Khan 11, Israel will hunt down Hamas leaders in Qatar, Turkey, and Lebanon, even if it takes years. I mean, that doesn't mean anything. Like, they know where they're at. They've always known where they're at. We've always heard about the problem of the problem of the problem of the problem לשבעה באוקטובר, אבל זאת גם הפעם הראשונה שבכיר ישראלי אומר מפורשות נחסל בכירי חמאס גם בקטאר, המתווכת בעסקה לשחרור חטופים, וגם בטורקיה, הנה ההקלטה שכמובן אושרה לשידור על ידי הצנזורה. By the censorship office. The cabinet set a goal for us. In everyday words, it is to eliminate Hamas. We are determined to do it. This is our Munich. Everywhere in Gaza, this is our Munich. Jesus Christ. At, at what point, at what point do you unironically start believing the, your own propaganda? I think, like, there are legitimately people out there at this point. Uh, there are legitimately people out there at this point that, like, believe their own shit like at first it was more so like a western focused propaganda op to be like hamas is nazis hamas is isis but now they're like no actually they are literally nazis like munich <laughs> also the reality of it is that uh they've been doing this they did this way more as a matter of fact uh in the in the 60s 70s 80s and even in the 90s if anything they've done this less uh, less frequently, they Israel used to openly assassinate uh, Hamas, not Hamas, sorry, Palestinian uh, leadership. Even those who had nothing to do with like war whatsoever, they've they've killed leaders of the DFLP, PFLP, many other groups. Might have even killed, maybe suspicious, but might have even killed Yasser Arafat. So. No, no, I know what he's referencing. He's referencing the 1972 Munich massacre and said this is their new Munich, meaning that they want to repeat Operation Grapes of Wrath while they hunted down and killed the 11 back Black September leaders possible. Oh, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. They're not, they're not talking about fucking, yeah, they're not talking about the actual Nazis. You're right. I, I, you're, you're absolutely right. I was thinking of the Munich movie while also simultaneously because it said Munich, I was thinking of Nazis. You are right. This is literally what I'm describing. <laughs> Great movie, by the way, even though. We're already learning from them, implementing other... Watch. Does not walk on eggshells, he doesn't say. Saying the Munich of our generation. So, um, Okay, anyway. Um, so they want war with other countries too then? No, there won't be there won't be war with other countries. Oh god damn, Dolce and Gabbana sent me a package. You think Israel's gonna annex Gaza? Like, what's their next move here? I do think so. Come on, Baba, Brak. Come on, Elle me show on the bush. Or Tom, I'll let him on the sun. Yere atma. Oh my God! Oh my God! Baba, lütfen bırakır mısın? Açma, tamam yeter.
It's a bill for stealing their suits. No, they want me to. They want me to work with them all the time. They just sent me more stuff. Come on, Baba, bırakır mısın? Anyway, here, let's watch uh, what Israel is doing in Gaza now. And yes, uh, this so-called new phase very much underway with uh, things expanding in the south. That's absolutely right. And the south is now the key point for the Israelis. Now, the reason for this, uh, say the Israelis, uh, even during the ceasefire, they were actually telling uh, Israeli citizens that, and through the media uh, that this is where Hamas's command and control center was, that this is where senior leaders, including Yahya Sinwar, was. Now, the route into the south leads through Khan Yunus. We've seen uh, a lot of Israeli military activity in that zone. That's what they call it. The Palestinians call it just bombardment, and that's what we've seen. And we've also seen ground forces go in. Now, this is very alarming to the Americans because they've said very clearly. Yeah, I guess it wasn't the Al-Shifa hospital, guys. I mean, color me surprised that uh, the command and control center of operations, I thought, was Al-Shifa. Turns out it's not. That's crazy. Uh, to the Israelis that they cannot use the same type of intensity of bombardment that they did in the north of the country. But that's exactly uh, what we're seeing. And the Israelis are very clear that they will conduct this war as far as they see fit. But even 59 days into the war, Hamas is still able to send rockets into uh, the Gaza, uh, from Gaza into the southern communities of Israel. Uh, the last alarm going off about 15, 20 minutes ago. So that's still something that's happening. And that does call into question the Israeli claims that they control uh, the north and the central part of the Strip. So all of this is going on. Meanwhile, pressure very much mounting on Benjamin Netanyahu from the families of captives being held in Gaza. Uh, we heard from them earlier today. Let's just have a quick listen to this. We are facing a very difficult emotional situation where the heavy disaster, along with this ominous silence, has led 136 families to despair. We request a meeting with the War Cabinet to receive updates on the fate of our family members now. Now, not tomorrow, now. If you don't have time for us, we will go to someone else and we will find the one who will represent us. Imran, what more do we know about this request for a meeting between the families and the War Cabinet? Well, there was some hope for the families. Uh, just a few hours ago, it was announced that they were due to meet uh, with the Israeli War Cabinet, the full Israeli War Cabinet, around about 8 p.m. local. Then that meeting got cancelled. Ostensibly, uh, say the Israeli uh, uh, spokesman for the, for the government, that actually uh, we needed to get a lot more members uh, of the families there that not everybody could attend. But that's uh, been dismissed by the families. We're hearing uh, that they're incredibly disappointed that this meeting did didn't take place. Um, uh, the meeting is scheduled for tomorrow, so the families are hopeful that they'll be able to push their case. Now, the Bring Them Back campaign... Now, Bibi isn't even listening to the families. He wasn't from day one. Now, I said this on literally October 8th, and I think that it's, uh, it's a statement that has been reiterated time and time again. Dude, I'm literally covering a fucking ethnic cleansing. If you're still fucking hyper-focused on Dolce & Gabbana... I'm, I don't know what to tell you, okay? Like, shut the fuck up, please, okay? Yes, I got it. Yeah, they're racist. Okay, fine. Please, shut the fuck up. Jesus Christ, dude. What the fuck? Just reorient your priorities, please. Oh, my God. They linked it again as you were yelling at them? Yeah, that's why I banned them for five minutes. Just calm down. Cool off, please. Anyway. As I was trying to state already. A point that needs to be reiterated over and over again is that the Israeli government's interests are not necessarily to protect Israeli citizens. It is to kill Palestinians. The moment that you recognize that Israel is more interested, Israel is a government, Israel is an extension of the American security apparatus, is more interested in the ethnic cleansing and ethnic displacement of Palestinians, more so than they are interested in a uh, permanent security assurance for the Israeli citizens. That When you recognize that, you start understanding exactly why Israel moves in the way that it does. 
And that's when you understand why Israel was too busy bombing Gaza immediately uh, after October 7, while there were still Palestinian militants that had overtaken positions inside of Israel proper. They did not secure the kibbutzim and instead immediately went in to start pummeling Gaza. Okay? Same with, it's the same exact principle behind moving all of your limited resources into the West Bank to continue rapidly expanding in the West Bank, to continue doing pogroms in the West Bank, to continue suppressing Palestinians in the West Bank. Somewhere, uh, a, a, a area that you have no business being inside of. It's a violation of international law, not that it fucking matters. Moving limited resources into the West Bank, away from southern communities and the border wall, created a perfect opportunity for Palestinian militants to strike. Increasing the tensions also simultaneously in the West Bank, understandably increased the tensions and the likelihood that there would be a national security issue inside of Israel proper. However, it's not like this was unforeseeable. It was perfectly foreseeable. As a matter of fact, New New York Times reporting shows that Israel did know ahead of time, but was very arrogant. Months ago, as I've shown you before, Shin Bet even said that the increased tensions in the West Bank would lead to national security concerns for Israel proper, to which the uh, Likud-backed cabinet said was woke, wokeness run amok amongst the internal security apparatus. Israel does not care. Israel as an entity does not care about Israeli citizens. They do not care about permanent security assurances. The last person that at least somewhat understood that in order to ensure permanent security in the region uh, uh, by, by negotiating with the Palestinians directly and in an honest capacity, even though you didn't want to give them a full-blown state, was Yitzhak Rabin, a figure who was assassinated for that crime by a far-right Israeli psychopath. Okay. Hey, which is the umbrella organization that represents the families, has a significantly loud voice in Israel. It is a pressure group that is able uh, to influence uh, a, certainly public opinion by taking this meeting. So Israel doesn't have the right to, to defend direct. itself. Um, this is a snarky, cynical way to approach the subject matter, but technically, according to international law, no, Israel does not have a right to defend itself against random Palestinian children. Uh, Israel is a belligerent occupier, and therefore, oh, from the top of the hour ad break, fuck you, god damn it. <sighs> At the top of the hour, there's a three-minute ad break. If you no longer want to see those ads, all you need to do is subscribe. In order to defend yourself from the top of the hour ad break, you can subscribe for $5 or for free. Here's the three-minute ad break now. God damn it. The man from the ether, thank you for the 10 gifted subs, allowing 10 people to no longer see the ads at the top of the hour. You too can get lucky. Let's continue. We translate into pressure on the people that can actually change things. And what they're looking for is a ceasefire to get more people out. Now, this is going to be very difficult for the Israelis because Hamas have already said that the negotiations now are over soldiers and military-aged uh, men and women that they have in captivity. In order to release those, they want a much more permanent truce. Imran, we'll leave it there for the moment. Thanks for that. Uh, Imran so, yeah. Yes, if you are wondering, if you are shocked, like I said, Israel is not listening to its own citizens and their own concerns about the hostages that are still inside of Gaza because they do not give a shit. Because ultimately, they care more about pummeling Gaza, breaking the backs of the Palestinians, making it as uh, inhabitable as possible to exist inside of Gaza, so much so that there are now reports coming out of Israeli troops unironically getting uh, extreme diarrhea and and diseases as a consequence of how shitty the water supply is and how limited the water supply is inside of Gaza proper. The troops that are invading Gaza are not able to deal with the limited infrastructure within Gaza. Ridiculous, I know.
Israel Hamas war no safe places in Gaza says family sheltering the hospital complex it doesn't matter where you are now in Gaza the fighting is getting closer and closer people are sheltering in this hospital courtyard in the north of Gaza outside the battle rages smoke rising from an airstrike nearby Further south, they're in tents again in the hospital complex. But in reality, it's not safe here either. Three-year-old Khalid was in one of those tents when a missile hit nearby. This is the intensive care unit. He's being treated on the floor. His distraught grandmother by his side. Khalid was hit by a single piece of shrapnel as he slept. <laughs> Yeah, the most dangerous, uh, uh, the most dangerous enemy combatant for Israel is a sleeping child in a tent next to a hospital. Those are the real victims here. After an entire, seemingly endless bombing campaign, where the Israeli occupying force claimed that Al Shifa was the main headquarters of Hamas, and uh, found very little evidence to suggest that that was the case after technically claiming that they cleared out the northern part of Gaza, hostages literally came out of North Gaza in the seven-day truce that occurred, showing to the rest of the world, and at least people who have like somewhat of an understanding of how military, is suppo- how military action is supposed to work, that Israel did not actually take control over the northern Gaza Strip at all that Hamas was still, and other Palestinian militias were still in operation within the northern parts, that they had been bombing endlessly. And now they have shifted their attention over to the southern parts. All this is doing is solidifying the stranglehold and the power and influence that all Palestinian militancy will have, reaffirming the support and creating Hamas 2, Hamas 3, and, and uh, making many other join the ranks of anyone that will violently resist against this belligerent occupier. This was the case before October 7th. It's terrifying. You posted a pic on your IG story of the IDF destroying a single apartment. The destruction they've done is even more disgusting, seeing their precision capabilities. Yes, Israel has the targeting capabilities and the striking capabilities of taking out a single floor in an apartment without even without even touching other floors okay they don't do it they don't use it regularly they take down entire city blocks deliberately they take down civil society areas like universities like the supreme court like the government buildings on purpose because they do not care about eliminating Hamas. That, have, that, have, that has never been their genuine goal. The Plus 972 magazine report showed that. The AI targeting that they're utilizing called the gospel showed that. It proved it. It is simply the Dahia doctrine. Okay? We've known about it. We've known about it since Israel's operations in Lebanon. We've known about it since 1948, if you want to go all the way back there. And it has never really stopped. But with technological improvements, their targeting capabilities have improved, and yet they refuse to choose to use those weapons because they do not care about precise targeting. We were sleeping in the tent when we found the boy bleeding, and when we took him inside the hospital, we saw that a missile had hit behind the hospital. And as you can see, he's injured and he's in the ICU. They say it's safe here. Here you go, the Dahia Doctrine, the punishing military doctrine that Israel may be following in Gaza. This was on November 10th on the Washington Post. It is what it is. That is precisely what's going on. Their goal has never been precise targeting. Their goal is to make it as difficult as possible for Palestinians to survive in the West Bank, to make it easier to engage in ethnic cleansing and ethnic displacement. What you are watching in front of your eyes tech is technological improvements upon the original 1948 uh, Nakba strategy. That's it. The only thing that has changed is the intensity 
and the frequency of the bombing campaigns and the number of deaths as a consequence of the population growth. That's it. This was how Israel was created. Okay? This was how Israel was created in the Nakba. And this is how Israel is continuing to expand into Gaza. In another hospital, or at a different time, Khalid may have lived, but he did not. He couldn't be saved here. Family took him away, another child lost. The Israeli Defense Forces have confirmed their operations in the north are nearing completion, and the focus now is on the south. They're but it's not. That's the thing. It's not nearing completion. It's not nearing completion at all. As, as the seven-day truce showed, Hamas and Islamic Jihad is still very much in operation in the northern Gaza Strip as well. They're still there. All they've done is destroy the infrastructure, the civilian infrastructure, the infrastructure that regular Palestinian citizens, 40, more than 40%, 47% are children, rely on. Their schools, the mosques, government buildings hospitals that's it those are the only places that have been eviscerated wiped out destroyed or abandoned one of those targets was a hospital that actually surprisingly didn't make it into the headlines except for uh this one newspaper headline that i read which was an unimaginable an unimaginable cruelty i'm going to show you and and one of my you know, one of the friends of the show uh, contributed to this article, and he's a great journalist. He didn't have anything to do with the obvious uh, naming uh, or the obvious titling of the article, but here it is. Four fragile lives found ended in evacuated Gaza hospital. Four fragile lives ended. I want you to see this. Evan Hill is a uh, part of the uh, team there that wrote this. Here's how that article was titled on the Washington Post on the website. Israel's assault forced a nurse to leave babies behind. They were found decomposing. A nurse at Al Nazar Hospital was caring for premature babies. Then he faced the most difficult decision of his life. Israel's cruelty is so apparent, so glaringly obvious here, that it was actually used as a justification babies being ripped out of incubators and thrown outside was used as a, a justification in the first Gulf War. That was found to be a lie, of course, but it's, it's that much of a cruelty to do this to a premature baby that it was originally used. It was originally used as a justification to engage in the first Gulf War. Turns out it was false, but that false narrative is very much real in Gaza. <clears throat> Tedros Adhanom Gebe Reus, I'm not saying it right, anyway, who is the director of general, who is the director general of World Health Organization, says, today the World Health Organization received notification from the IDF that we should remove our supplies from our medical warehouse in southern Gaza within 24 hours. <coughs> As <coughs> ground operations will put it beyond use. We appeal to Israel to withdraw the order and take every possible measure to protect civilians and civilian infrastructure, including hospitals and humanitarian facilities. Nothing to do. Nothing you can do to stop it. Laila al Arian says... If we lived in a world that valued Palestinian life, the story of decomposing bodies of babies left in the Gaza hospital because Israel forced medical workers out would lead all of the headlines. But because we do not live in that world, those headlines do not exist. And the times where that headline does exist, or places where that headline does exist, is greatly manipulated. Just something to consider, something to remember, something to remind yourself of. I've seen... So many odd takes on the timeline. And one of the oddest counters here is from Israel defenders talking about how ISIS burned uh, Yazidis 
and Christians. Except, if you are a defender of Israel, you should probably know that ISIS and ISIS-style groups have always been aligned with Israel. In Syria, specifically, al-Nusra is a partner of Israel. Israel has long talked about openly how they much prefer al-Nusra in Syria to Bashar al-Assad. Many of the coalitions in that region, all of the Muslim forces in that region, openly fought against ISIS. From the Kurds to the Iranians to the Iranian-backed militias, Israel is the one regional power that openly aligned with ISIS-style Salafist brigades. So why is it that people, why is it that people keep repeating this narrative? Yep, because if al-Nusra is in Syria, Israel can invade and take more land. That's not the real reason. The enemy of our enemy is our friend is exactly what's going on there. Okay? Just something to consider when you hear uh, people talk about ISIS and how nobody cares about ISIS in the region. <laughs> What's more is that the Syrian regime and Assad has strategically intensified its assault on civilians in Idlib as the attention focuses on Gaza. Here, here is some stuff to show you. Um, here's a Times of Israel article. Where is it? Hold on. Um, let me see if I can find it. Hold on. Are they even trying to give legit reasons for doing anything anymore? It seems like they're just going full mask off at this point. Yes. In vertigo, Israel remain obsessed. Wait, what is this? Red. No. Hold on. No, this is a much, much older article I'm trying to find right now. What are you looking for? The many different times in which, like, uh, Israel defense ministers and, and other members of the Knesset have talked about how they prefer uh, in Syria the power to be in the hands of al-Nusra rather than Bashar al-Assad. There is, of course, older articles, if you go back in time to, like, 2013, where they say they prefer Assad to al-Nusra or any kind of, like, uh, Wahhabist uh, involvement. But that changed very quickly. In practice, I'm trying to uh, show the different instances where, like, they've offered material. Uh, they've offered material support. They've offered, uh, like, directly members in uh, ISIS uh, health care. And things of that nature. Yeah. Al Nusra Hospital Israel. Well, they halted it. Israel halts medical treatment for members of Syria's Nusra Front. The change took place a month after Israeli Druze ambushed wounded Syrian rebels and transported in IDF ambulances, killing one of them, one of the men. Five members of the Druze community were later arrested on suspicion of murder. Oh, here. IDF chief finally acknowledges that Israel supplied weapons to Syrian rebels. That's one of the articles. Outgoing IDF chief of staff Gadi Eisenkot this weekend acknowledged for the first time that Israel had indeed provided weaponry to Syrian rebels groups in the Golan Heights during the country's seven-year civil war. Until Sunday, Israel would uh, say only officially that it had given humanitarian aid to Syrian opposition groups across the border while denying or refusing to comment on reports that it had supplied them with arms as well. Yeah. Direct funding, food, fuel, and medical supplies allegedly provided by the Israeli state to keep ISIS and Iranian allied uh, forces in neighboring civil war at bay. Oh, this was the one I was thinking of. No, no, not this one. Israel prefers Bashar Assad to Islamist rebels? No, this is originally back in 2013 they said this. And then they changed their policy shortly thereafter.
Anyway. Our friends who were serving the Air Force at times would get told to stand down a couple hours later some targets would be struck by Israel. Please don't be one of those believers who started the entire Syrian revolution was started by Israel. We had every right to take down Assad. No, I'm not stating that at all. I'm simply stating that Israel did take advantage of the situation and and use it as an opportunity to, one, um, you know, reinforce uh, the goal on Heights annexation, and two, absolutely engaged in destabilization alongside the United States by directly and openly supporting al-Nusra and many other al-Qaeda-style or ISIS-style militancies in the region. I am, contrary to popular opinion, not an Assadist by any means. Okay? But let's be for fucking real for a brief moment here. You can't get away with claiming that you are attacking ISIS or that ISIS is this grave evil in the region while simultaneously defending offering material support, offering logistical support, offering health care to ISIS-style militancies. Okay? The idea behind the Israeli policy essentially meant that the rebel groups in southern Syria would not likely attack across the Golan Heights, but allowing Assad back in would bring Iran and Hezbollah that intervened in the civil war in the Golan Heights border. This is, of course, again, ridiculous considering the fact that Golan Heights is annexed territory which Israel also occupies, which it has no business being inside of, but, you know, that's besides the point. Yet another, uh, yet another ongoing continued occupation campaign that the Western world looks uh, at and turns a blind eye to, or rather, supports directly. So, just a fun reminder for everyone. Whenever uh, you hear... Whenever you hear people talk about Israel, whenever you hear people talk about how Israel is claiming that it's ISIS, if Assad falls, Syria will be split into part terror, part will be in charge of the USA. I don't like Assad, but he holds Syria. What do you want? Sold the country to the West. So, that's the circumstances at hand. Um, as Israel's bombing campaign continues, unimaginable, unimaginable amounts of cruelty. He resources a dangerous and unusual outbreak of the Shigella, Shigella bacteria among the occupation soldiers in Gaza. Massive cause of diarrhea and intestinal disease were recorded. It suggested the reason is poor storage of food supplies. Apparently, the, the IDF don't want to eat, like, the meals ready to eat, the MREs. So they're eating, like, uh, food that is not being uh, held in cold storage, which is supposed to be, uh, that the uh, civilians are, are donating to the military and because it's not stored properly, they are fucking shitting themselves like directly shitting their pants. Just, uh, you know, another, I guess, omen to consider. Let's continue. Pictures show soldiers taking positions deeper and deeper into Gaza. The instruction to the population is to move further south immediately. We are giving precise instructions to Gazan residents near Hamas centers of gravity, urging them to temporarily move away from the danger that Hamas puts them in. But it's not easy. This is the road south. A woman with children and local journalists are attacked. They run for safety. Attacked by who? Whistle by. Why they were targeted is unclear. Who's shooting at them? They were heading south. I wonder, who was shooting at them? From across the border, the continuing targeting of the strip is clear to see. Gaza City shrouded in smoke for much of the time. Groups of mostly American well-wishers are being given a tour of the various kibbutzim attacked by Hamas on October the 7th. They're at the border fence area. Amongst them, pediatric consultant Richard Schusler. 
His job is saving children's lives. His support for Israel is absolute, but it's difficult knowing what's happening so nearby. I cry when I see Palestinian mothers holding little tiny corpses. Um, it's horrific. Um, and I'm outraged. But I'll, I'll tell you, as somebody who's pro-Israeli, very Zionistic, I feel horrible seeing those pictures. Um, as somebody who's gone around the world to try to help children. But I'll tell you, every bit of that outrage and anger is not directed at the IDF. It's directed at the cowards of Hamas. Yeah, it's a good way. It's a good way to launder uh, genocidal rhetoric to people who are otherwise like kind-hearted liberals. That's it. Like that dude himself is probably not a bad person uh, with this very big notable exception. This very big notable blind spot. You guys understand this, right? It's important to recognize the cognitive biases that these people have, okay? The IDF says uh, Gaza's main north-south road in the uh, Khan Yunus area is a battle zone as it designates a new humanitarian corridor. That's it. That dude is like, I'm a huge Zionist. I cry for Palestinian children and Palestinian mothers holding their children, but it's Hamas's fault that they're dying. It's like, really? Is it Hamas that's dropping the bombs on them? Because it doesn't feel like it. it. It seems like it's Israeli weapons, American weapons that Israel is using in the area. You know? It's just like, at that point, who cares? Yeah. Necessary evil, guys. It's just, you have to do it. You have to do a little bit of ethnic cleansing to, to fucking deal with the situation. Israel's right to defend itself is undoubted, but it's the cost to human life that's the issue. And the numbers of civilian dead is equally undoubtedly rising. Stuart Ramsey, Sky News, Southern Israel. Desperate residents of Khan Yunis flee on foot, carrying what they can of their belongings. On Monday, Israel ordered people out of swathes of the main <clears throat> southern city in the Gaza Strip. As they left, bombs fell on areas still described as safe. Many are being displaced for a... I, I hope people understand that this was never about self-defense. It was always about offense, okay? And it has never stopped being about offense. It wasn't self-defense on October 6th, and it certainly wasn't self-defense on October 7th. Self-defense and uh, attacking Hamas is simply the justification used to do this ethnic cleansing campaign. It's been self-defense for 75 fucking years, okay? It's not. It's conquest. That's it. For a second or third time since the war broke out on October 7th, <laughs> Hamdi Zahir Yeah, I, I showed Gaza this before. Says I showed this uh, the day that it happened. This is in uh, Khan Yunus, right? There you go. If Israel wanted to do a surgical strike, they could do that. Okay? It, it, the Israel Air Force this morning took out the fourth floor and the only fourth floor of a high-end residential building in southern Gaza. The target was the residence of a senior Hamas official. First and foremost, this is still a war crime. Okay? You can't do that. Like, there is no, there is no world in which you go, okay, I've decided I'm going to take out the fucking family of, like, a senior Hamas official. You can't do that, okay? You, you're just, like, attacking a residential building. I know that, like, our mentality is so distorted, okay? So even this is technically not allowed. However, they also have this capability. They can take out just one floor instead of destroying the entire building. And yet they still destroy the entire building regularly, okay? Okay? So even this would still be a war crime, but would be a much more limited war crime, and they're not even doing the much more limited war crime. They're doing the much worse war crime. So just remember that. Okay? I don't know how much more evidence I can show you other than premature babies being uh, withered away. No power. Uh, as, as the IDF takes over hospitals in Gaza, 
evacuates nurses and then just like leaves those babies on their beds, on the hospital beds to die without even taking them, without even giving them the proper medical care necessary. The nurses that evacuated that hospital openly stated, we thought that the, at least Israel would have the decency to take those children and offer them, to take those babies and offer them medical care absolute ne uh, absolutely necessary. And they just left them there. He sheltered for a month in the Ashifa hospital, then was ordered south to the safe areas they're now being told to evacuate. Send us to the grave and be done with it, he says. Some 80% of Gaza's 2.3 million people have now been made homeless. In an Israeli bombing campaign that has reduced much of the crowded coastal strip to a desolate wasteland. Israeli forces largely captured the northern half of Gaza in November. Since a week-long truce collapsed on Friday, they have pushed deep into the southern half. This house in Khan Yunus was struck overnight. Misreen Abdul Moti lives next door with her daughter and two-year-old baby. They told us to move from the north to Khan Yunus since the south is safer. And now they've bombed Khan Yunus. Even Khan Yunus is not safe now. And even if we move to Rafa, Rafa is not safe either. Where do they want us to go? The parts of Khan Yunus people were ordered to leave were home to more than 350,000 people before the war, the UN says, not counting the hundreds of thousands who crowded in to take shelter from the bombs. Medical officials in the enclave say Israel's bombing has killed more than 15,500 people, with thousands more missing and feared buried under the rubble. Israel launched its assault to annihilate Hamas in retaliation for the October 7th attack by its gunmen who killed 1,200 people and seized 240 hostages, according to Israeli tallies. Certainly, he has used increasingly harsh rhetoric, not just against Israel and the Israeli military actions inside Gaza, but also specifically against Benjamin Netanyahu, the prime minister, um, declaring him again today a war criminal, saying that he should be tried. He made similar comments uh, in Dubai at the climate conference just a few days ago, where again he called on the international community, the United Nations, international humanitarian law makers to come into action and to put specifically Benjamin Netanyahu on trial. I already talked about this earlier, that it is absolutely meaningless, and everything he says is completely meaningless. It's, it's not a real thing at all. Okay? It's just, it's, it's no different. It is no different than uh, what the Saudi leadership says. Okay? They say all of this because they recognize that they need to maintain their popularity. They need to maintain their popularity. They know that on the ground... The people of Turkey are pro-Palestinian. On the ground, Saudis are pro-Palestinian. In Egypt, Egyptians are pro-Palestinian. But their leaders have to maintain their strategic allegiances with Israel. They are all mere expressions or extensions of U.S. foreign policy. Okay? That is precisely what's going on with Erdogan as well. Erdogan is the leader of a nation that is a NATO nation. Turkey is a NATO country. So he can say whatever the fuck he wants, but ultimately, oil is passing through from Azerbaijan into Turkey and directly into Israel. 40% of the oil that Israel gets, they get through Turkey. Okay? Okay. I believe it's like around 30 plus percent of all the steel that Israel gets, they get from Turkey directly. But it doesn't really matter. Okay? They would never in a million years do anything. They would never in a million years say, we're shutting it off. Because America will not do that. America will not take the action necessary. And without America taking the action necessary, these are just hollow points. They're just shallow pandering talking points it's pure political theater trial for committing war crimes and what he calls uh, uh, you know crimes against humanity he's due to fly off uh, to doha later today uh, where he's going to try and position himself as a facilitator of peace particularly trying to push forward 
another ceasefire or lay the groundworks for another ceasefire to stop the bombing inside Gaza Strip. The other key question... Turkey doesn't deserve Erdogan. Turkey should be in the EU and rid herself of this dictator. First of all, uh, Erdogan or no Erdogan, Turkey's not getting into the European Union. Let's be fucking real, okay? Turkey is never going to be a part of the European Union. It's Muslim. It's a Muslim nation. Good luck. A Muslim nation with 90 million people, 90 million Muslims? Are you out of your mind? You think the EU would open up the floodgates of 90 million Muslims? There's just no shot that that would ever happen. The question, though, that you pose is just how much weight does he carry? And certainly he carries a lot of weight within parts of the Arab world. There's no doubt about that. The Muslim world, uh, he's, a, he's a mover and shaker. He's definitely uh, a, a very um, adept uh, facilitator of certain things, particularly in Turkey. But remember, in other parts of the world, he himself is not considered the, uh, a particularly role model upholder of uh, human rights. He's long waged uh, a war and a persecution against the Kurds, for instance, not just in the north of Turkey, but also across the border in Syria. So that certainly takes away part of his moral uh, compass, if you like, and his, his ability to preach morals and take... I love this idea that, like, oh, Turkey can't say anything because they're operating in the northern Syrian corridor. And it's like, yeah, that's precisely the reason why Turkey can say whatever the fuck they want, okay? They'll say whatever the fuck they want, but America still lets them operate in the northern Syrian corridor. Why does nobody ask the question how or why? Why is Turkey allowed to do that? Oh, that's right, because of the things that I just mentioned. Erdogan can say whatever the fuck he wants while also simultaneously controlling the northern Syrian corridor and engage in military operations whenever the fuck they want to because they're doing the bidding of Western forces at that point. Western leadership allows them to do that. They give them the go-ahead. Okay? You think a fucking foreign nation, especially a Muslim one too, you think a foreign nation would be allowed to attack another foreign nation like that without America not giving them the go-ahead? Get the fuck out of here. The only reason why Erdogan gets to do that and also say whatever the fuck he wants to is because the reality is he's also supporting Israel aggressively where it fucking matters, okay? Yok abi çok güçlü olduğumuz için korkuyorlar bizden ondan bir şey demiyorlar araştırma öneririm. What? No. Güçlü olduğumuzla alakası yok. Saçma sapan konuşma. Evet inanılmaz. Ha dalga geçiyorum. Okay. Jesus Christ. I thought this guy was being serious. He's like nah dude they're just afraid of how powerful our military is but he was joking. He was being sarcastic. Praying for Palestine and mosques and raising the Palestinian flags in public is banned by Saudi Arabia rulers and those violating it will be punished for crimes, claims man in viral video. I don't know how real that is, but I have heard something similar in Egypt too. Like uh, demonstrations are demonstrations that are pro-Palestine are, are uh, severely limited. I don't know if it's the case in Saudi Arabia. But like I know that even in, even in uh, Jordan... I know that the Jordan security forces have unironically apprehended pro-Palestinian demonstrators. They've done that. But it's happening in the Western world as well. We are doing it. We are doing it in the Western world too. When you, I mean, you have literally fucking German citizens, German Jews even, that are demonstrating for Palestine, getting apprehended. So why the fuck wouldn't it happen in those countries? Not to be nationalistic, Azerbaijani, but I think Ilham Aliyev supports Israel only because the Turkish government does. Is this true, though? They both operate. Uh, they, they're both massive trade partners, as I described already. That's the reason. And also, they used Israeli weapons in Karabakh to purge Karabakh of all Armenians. So, of course... Uh, there is a massive allegiance there. 
Yeah. Take the high moral ground on this. But as the other ironic part about this is also Russia. Russia is supposedly pro Palestine, right? Russia is pro Palestinian. They say they're pro Palestinian all the time. Except Israel aligning with Azerbaijan was only able to purge that entire region of Armenians because Russia no longer was offering security assurances to the Armenians in that region. That could have never happened without Russia's go ahead. So all of these regional players are constantly fucking, uh, constantly playing a song and dance, but the reality is they're all in bed with one another through numerous proxies. Not to mention that I believe what, like almost 20% of the uh, Israeli population is Russian, that there is that too. As far as Gaza is concerned, he has been resolute from the start that there should be no bombing inside Gaza, that there are more than two million people crammed into a very small space, that to uh, bombard that area is basically consigning... For sure the U.S. signs off eventually on the ops, but the Turkish operation in northern Syria was definitely not in America's interest, and the U.S. argued with Turkey as much. It targeted the Kurdish SDF. Wait. Elon, brother, come on. How many times has this song and dance happened between Turkey and America? America arms the Kurds. America offers logistical support to the Kurdish militias. America tell, dangles the Kurdish nation state in front of the Kurdish militias every single time and then literally pulls out entirely and says, go ahead, Turkey, do whatever the fuck you want to these guys that we just gave weapons to. Turkey looks at that and goes, these guys are terrorists. These guys are fucking terrorists. They're doing terror. We have to deal with them. Wipes them the fuck out. America gives them the go-ahead every single time. That has never been different. This switcheroo has happened so many fucking times. The problem is the Kurds have nothing. They have nothing. They are a 35 million ethnic group in permanent diaspora. They have no autonomy. They have no nation state. So because they have nothing, they literally turn around and go, okay, fuck it. Like, we'll, we'll deal with America, even though we know they're going to leave us behind. That has always been the case. Why do they do it? Because they have nothing. I'm telling you, they got nothing. What are they supposed to do? They have nothing. This has been going on since the 90s. What about northern Iraq? How is nothing? I mean, okay, fine. They have an autonomous area in northern Iraq. Great. <sighs> and the reason why the United States does not create a Kurdistan in the area is twofold. One, if they do have a Kurdistan, if they do actually have a region, if they do actually have a nation state in the region, they're not as controllable. Okay, they're not as easy to manipulate. But the major reason as to why, the major reason as to why they will never allow Kurdistan to happen is because Turkey is a NATO country. Turkey is an incredibly important asset for the United States of America. Turkey has American nukes in the Injilik base. America's not going to uh, cave and, and, uh, and, and take a red line away from it's very important NATO ally with a massive military. So they'll keep dangling it in front of the Kurds over and over again. Um, hundreds of thousands, possibly more civilians to death. And he's been quite unequivocal in his uh, defense of Hamas. In, in Turkey, Hamas is not seen as a terrorist organization. In fact, he's declared Israel to be the terrorist state, the occupier and the uh, pursuer of, of... I mean, Israel is a terrorist nation, yes. On timeout, Elon. I'm saying they were using them against the Iranians. I'm not suggesting that the U.S. doing it out of values or supports Kurds, uh, Kurds necessarily. The operations against the Kurds in northern Syria in 2019 was not a common event. It may have been in northern Iraq, but the U.S. wasn't using Kurdish forces in northern Iraq against Iranian sub supply lines. The aiming of the 2019 Turkish operation was absolutely not in the U.S. interest at that time. I'm just simply stating that it doesn't matter, and America will still uh, turn a blind eye to that, even if it goes against their interest, because that is the assurance 
that Turkey always has. And that is also part of the reason why Turkey is not interfering with supplies going into Israel through Turkish pipelines. That's my point. My point is, Erdogan can say whatever the fuck he wants and position himself as anti-Israel, but the reality is, where it actually matters, Erdogan is very much pro-Israel. The biggest pro-Israel. Okay? That's it. Kurds are not a power player in the region. They are not even a minor player in the region. They're just a militia force that America utilizes against whoever the fuck they deem the enemy at the time. ...of uh, war crimes inside Gaza, and he's portrayed and identified Hamas to a very willing Muslim population in Turkey as a, a resistance movement. So from that point of view, he, he does represent a lot of people's uh, views, particularly in the Muslim world, where it's seen very, very differently. The whole approach from the Muslim and the Islamic world is seen... Uh, about Israel's actions and the Israeli military actions inside Gaza is viewed very, very differently here. Uh, it's so interesting, Alex. I mean, uh, two, two kind of uh, linked follow-up questions for you, which is, does he differ in his view with the West uh, on this war much more so than he does with the Russia-Ukraine war? Or has he also taken uh, the side uh, of Russia there in, in a way that he's uh, taking the side, perhaps, of Hamas in this particular conflict? And... Does he need to do this for a domestic audience? Because there was a period of time a couple of years ago where there were questions about his ability to hold on to power. power. He's had for many, many years, of course, in Turkey. But that is somewhat behind him now, is it not? I mean, I think he definitely um, is straddling a very difficult <coughs> situation in Turkey. They've got uh, an absolutely rampant inflation problem here and huge growing economic problems. Um, so he, he's very mindful of that. I mean, the exchange rate, for instance, against the pound is 36 at the moment. When I first came here a few years ago, it was five. So, uh, you know, at, at Christmas a year ago, it was nearly 100% rate of inflation. It's still growing almost by the day, definitely by the week. So people's um, pay packets are not worth as much. And, that, and he's definitely got his eye on that. But you are, he is president of a, uh, a huge uh, Muslim country. And at the start of um, the ground invasion, at the start of the Israeli bombardment inside Gaza, there were quite large demonstrations uh, across the main cities, and including uh, attacks on the Israeli embassy and uh, the American embassy. Uh, there, there was a lot of anger about what Israel is doing inside Gaza. As I say, the view from this part of the world, uh, and also in, in other parts of the world, you know, Lebanon, Egypt, uh, you know, the, the surrounding um, Islamic countries, is it, viewed very, very differently. They, they're looking at uh, 75 years of, of, <laughs> of things, you know, being tilted against the Palestinians, and they very much um, don't like the way that America is positioning itself as the puppet master with Israel and uh, all the, the um, weaponry that's being sold to Israel, the political... Uh well, why does he paint it for Palestine when behind closed doors he supports Israel? What do you mean? Because the population supports Palestine. That is how it is. And because he's not America, okay? In the United States of America, you could just say uh, you can be an American politician and, and look at, like, a sea of overwhelming support for Palestinians and go, fuck off, don't care, shut the fuck up, uh, and, and, you know, throw out a couple feelers in the media, like, oh, Israel, restrain yourself, Israel, restrain yourself, while well, they continue their fucking mass ethnic cleansing campaign with our weapons as we still send them bunker busters and the like, okay? In Turkey, on the other hand, the population is like, what the fuck? We, you know, what are you doing? Like, if the population, if Erdogan responded to the situation in the same way that John Fetterman did, he would probably get fucking assassinated, okay? People would be like, what are you saying? Are, are you insane? It would be unimaginably unpopular. He would unironically never win an election ever again. So he has to talk like that. He has to say these sorts of things because Turkey is not like America. 
The population, understandably, is overwhelmingly in support of Palestinians. They are overwhelmingly against American involvement. They are overwhelmingly against what Israel is doing. They are too close to the subject matter to see it as anything but that. And the same goes for every single fucking country in the region. Damn, this guy's good.